Alrighty, good morning. My name is Donovan Richards and I'm the chair of the Public Safety Committee. We are actually having two hearings today. First, we will hold a vote on two bills, introduction number 1234-A, local law to amend the New York City Charter in relation to creating an office for the prevention of hate crimes sponsored by Councilmember Levine, and introduction 1261-A-A, -A, a local law to amend the New York City Charter in relation to requiring educational outreach within the Office of Prevention of Hate Crimes sponsored by Councilmember Deutsch. Uh, in November, when we heard these bills, we learned about the NYPD's Hate Crimes Task Force. While they appear to be doing excellent work, we also learned that their job is focused on investigating crimes and finding the perpetrators. Their work is not about addressing the underlying reasons that people turn to hate, and it's not up to them to make sure that young people in the city learn to embrace the diversity we cherish. One thing really struck me was how often hateful speech and conduct that people experience doesn't rise to the level of a crime, but nonetheless has severe consequences. In some ways, the statement can have a more lasting impact than the crime. I said in November that as a society, we can't just rely on the police to change minds and hearts. This is something we are going to have to do together. The hearing convinced me that was that was absolutely true and that these bills are absolutely necessary. An office within the administration dedicated to coordinating a response between our city agencies, making sure that victims and communities targeted by hatred are made to feel safe again, and conducting education and outreach about the impact of hate speech and value of a multicultural society would implement would complement the efforts of the NYPD and will help guarantee that people in all of our communities feel welcome in this great city. And just as we come off of MLK Day, I wanted to certainly quote one of his most powerful quotes, which is, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Oh, let me start from the beginning. Returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. That being said, uh, I am going to turn uh, the mic over to Councilmember Deutsch, who is a lead sponsor on intro 1261A. Thank you, Chair. Um, with the recent rise in hate crimes across our city and country, it is important that we as elected officials make every effort to promote tolerance and understanding. Today we are voting on intro 1261, a bill co-sponsored by Councilmember Donovan Richards and myself, which would require the city to do educational outreach and training in schools and within our community to educate people about the impact and effect of hate crimes. This bill works in concert with Councilmember Levine's intro 1234, which establishes a hate crime prevention office. Intro 1261 will require this office to coordinate with relevant agencies, interfaith organizations, and community groups to implement effective outreach on this subject. In addition, Intro 1261 will also require the Hate Crime Prevention Office to work with the Department of Education to create a curriculum within the New York City school system to address issues relating to hate crimes. Our city is a melting pot, home of New Yorkers from 150 countries who speak more than 80 different languages. And 40% of New Yorkers are immigrants. Mutual respect and understanding of people with different ethnicities, religions, and belief systems can go a long way towards creating a more peaceful, tolerant New York City. With that, I vote aye, and I encourage my colleagues to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Deutsch. I just want to acknowledge uh, the members we are joined by this morning, Councilmembers Cohen, Deutsch, Powers, Menchaca, Rodriguez, Valone, and Cabrera. All righty, I guess I will call ex the clerk to call the roll. William Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote committee on public safety, introductions 1, 2, 3, 4A, and 1261A. Both items are coupled. Chair Richards. I vote aye. Cabrera. Aye. Cohen. Aye. Deutsch. Aye. Menchaca. Aye. Rodriguez. Permission to explain my vote? Yes, sir. 
I believe that every single group in our city, in our nation, has been a victim of hate crimes. You can go back to the beginning of the 20th centuries, look at the Irish, the Italians, Afro-American being a victim, the Jewish have been a victim of hate crimes. As someone born and raised in another country, recent immigrants that came here in 1983, we have lived a lot of experience of being victim of hate crimes. So I feel that creating this office and taking the necessary step to address how we as a city had to be a leading one addressing hate crimes and to eradicate hate crime regardless who those hate crimes have been committed against it with message, with action, or intention. So for me, again, as someone that have been shoulder to shoulder working with the rest of my colleagues from the Anglo, the Jewish community, Afro-American, the LGBTQ community, and all of us, I'm signing my name in the bill that I had not been added to, especially 1234-8, and very proud of Ike. Malone. Powers. I and all. My vote of eight in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Both items have been adopted by the committee. Okay. All righty. Thank you. All righty. I will now close this out. All righty. We will now move on uh, to the oversight portion of today's agenda, the Civilian Complaint Review Board. Uh, we are also hearing a bill I am sponsoring, introduction number 1106, a local law to amend the administrative code of the city of New York. Okay, we'll start back over. Okay, the vote is adjourned. All right, we thought the vote was adjourned. We're gonna reopen it. Continuation roll call vote, Committee on Public Safety, Council Member Brennan. I vote aye. Vote now stands at nine in the affirmative. All right, the vote is now adjourned again.
It's a microphone check. Today's date, January 22nd, 2019. Committee on Public Safety being recorded by John Biondo. We will now open, move on to the oversight portion of today's agenda, the Civilian Complaint Review Board. Before I begin, uh, I would like to acknowledge Council Members Cohen, Deutsch, Powers, Menchaca, Rodriguez, Valone, Cabrera, and Brennan. Um, today we are hearing a bill I'm sp sponsoring, introduction number 1106, a local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to requiring the Civilian Complaint Review Board to report information relating to truncated investigations. The CCRB's work investigating and prosecuting allegations against NYPD officers charged with misconduct has provided critical oversight of one of the city's most powerful agencies. Many of our citizens have turned to the CCRB seeking justice at times when it felt like there was none to be had. Many of our NYPD officers have believed that they would not get a fair shake only to find that they were exonerated by a thorough investigation. And as I'm sure we will discuss today, that happens in a lot of cases. In fact, the large majority of CCRB complaints are not substantiated. That doesn't mean that the allegations aren't true. Even though in the past I've been critical of abuses by members of the police department, I have to acknowledge that many times being a police officer involves making difficult decisions and walking a fine line. And while an individual might not like how they were treated, there are times when something of sudden doesn't rise to the level of misconduct. And I know the CCRB works hard to be fair to complainants and officers alike precisely because there are those close calls. But there are also other times, far too many times, when there is simply no question that an officer has done something wrong. No one here will forget what happened to Eric Garner, more recently, Jasmine Headley. And as more and more cell phone videos surface, it's clear that there are and always have been countless others who names we do not know who are victims of inexcusable abuses of authority. And for those times, we need a robust, powerful CCRB to thoroughly investigate, to preserve evidence, and to do everything within their power to hold the officers accountable. The officer who killed Eric Garner will finally face a department, tar, departmental trial prosecuted by the CCRB. The CCRB is also investigating what happened at the HRA office a few weeks ago. So today, I want to find out how we can support their mission and give them the tools they need to be successful. I'm also curious how the increase in video footage from witness cell phones and body-worn cameras has affected the success of their investigations. I want to learn about their mediation process and whether that has been a meaningful method of resolving disputes between civilians and police officers. I want to hear how the Right to Know Act has affected their work and what efforts the CCRB has undertaken to ensure that the law is being followed. But there are critical questions we must ask as well. Is there more the CCRB can and should be doing? Is there anything it can be doing better? I'm sponsoring a bill about truncated investigations because I want to make sure there are good reasons for closing cases without a full investigation. In addition, we need to find out if, board, if the board has the authority to accomplish real and meaningful changes to an NYPD disciplinary system that has no transparency and too often makes it seem as if the NYPD is above the law. Finally, we will address how the commissioner's authority to overrule a CCRB recommendation affects the value of the CCRB process and what we can do to strengthen that process. With these questions in mind, I would like to welcome the CCRB and ask that the witnesses be sworn in. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and answer all questions to the best of your ability? I do. I do. Um, before we do that, I just want to uh, mention we've been joined by Councilmember Gibson. You may begin. Thank you. 
Chairperson Richards and members of the Public Safety Committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear uh, here today before you. I am the Reverend Frederick Davey, Chair of the New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board. The City Charter charges the CCRB with the fair and independent investigation of civilian complaints against sworn members of the New York City Police Department. The CCRB is the largest police oversight entity in the country, overseeing the investigation, mediation, and administrative prosecution of misconduct in the largest police department in the country. Our jurisdiction includes allegations involving use of force, abuse of authority, discourtesy, and the use of offensive language referred to as FATO. Where the evidence supports disciplinary action, the board recommends specific categories of discipline to the police commissioner. In 2018, the CCRB received 4,745 complaints within its jurisdiction, making the second year of an increase in complaints following seven straight years of declining complaint numbers. While there are multiple reasons for what is driving this growth, we believe one explanation is the agency's focused commitment to better serving vulnerable and diverse communities in New York City. This, the last few years have seen a tremendous expansion of the work of the CCRB Outreach Unit, which delivered over 1,000 presentations in 2018, the largest number in the, agency, in the agency's history to audiences including high school students, immigrant populations, probationary groups, homeless service organizations, formerly incarcerated individuals, NYCHA residents, and LGBTQ groups. Outreach staff has met members of the public where they are, from marching in the New York City's Pride Parade alongside with the city's LGBT, LGBTQ communities, to developing productive partnerships with community service providers, including homeless shelters, schools, and organizations serving youth. All agency board meetings are open to the public, and half of those meetings are conducted in, various city, in, in the city's various communities, where residents can attend and meet with our staff and express to the board their issues and concerns in a local setting. Board meeting locations range from schools and faith centers to New York City Housing Authority facilities and senior centers. Part of the CCRB's renewed efforts to better serve the public includes additional focus on public education, on its public education mandate. In anticipation of the Right to Know Act becoming effective in October of 2018, the CCRB constructed a, public, a full public education campaign in partnership with members of the City Council that involved creation of educational materials and distribution of these materials via street fair via street team efforts, participation in press and social media efforts, and working with elected officials to help provide information to constituents. These efforts appear to have been timely. 2018 saw the highest number of fourth quarter complaints received in the CCRB's jurisdiction, that's 1,301, since 2013. The proportion of complaints received in the fourth quarter compared with the rest of the year, went from 23.6% of complaints received in 2017 to 27.4% of complaints received in 2018. The CCRB strives to be a model in the field of police accountability, pursuing new initiatives to enhance the efficacy of investigations and prosecutions and to more effectively serve the people of New York City. Of these initiatives includes the board's pilot program of its disciplinary framework initiated in January 2018. The framework is a non-binding matrix designed to guide board panel discussions on disciplinary recommendations for substantiated cases. The goal of the framework is to achieve consistent and fair discipline recommendations for civilians and members of the service. The framework outlines six allegation types, if substantiated by a three-member board panel, typically would result in the panel recommending charges and specifications, the most severe level of discipline. These allegations include chokeholds, strip searches, warrantless entries, offensive language, excessive 
force with serious injury and sexual misconduct. Under the framework, board panels also discuss the subject officer's CCRB history and the totality of circumstances of the case as a way to guide its determination of the appropriate disciplinary recommendation. As a pilot program reaches its full year of implementation this month, agency staff will examine data related to its impact and make recommendations to the board based on these findings. As a national leader in police oversight, the board also periodically reviews its categories to determine whether they fully serve the needs of the public. In February 2018, the board adopted a resolution directing agency staff to begin investigating certain allegations of sexual misconduct that had previously been referred to the NYPD's Internal Affairs Bureau and to develop a plan to investigate allegations of sexual misconduct. Since then, the agency have re has received complaints of more than 80 allegations of sexual harassment, sexual romantic propositions, sexual humiliation, and sexually motivated strip searches, and has created an internal working group to determine how best to incorporate investigations and prosecutions of sexual, sexual assault into the agency's operations. The agency takes seriously its commitment to protecting the mental health and well-being of these and all complainants. The CCRB serves some of New York's most vulnerable communities, including youth, the homeless, LGBTQ individuals, and those with mental illnesses, people living with disabilities, and people of low income. In 2018, we have worked diligently to develop strong relationships with mental health and, com and community support service providers to more responsibly serve the needs of complainants, victims, and witnesses. In April of 2018, the CCRB adopted a new policy of providing civilians with information about New York Well, a city program that provides free support and assistance to people experiencing stress and trauma, as well as more serious mental, psychological, and emotional health challenges. The CCRB training unit collaborated with Dr. Lynn Kaplan, the Director of Training and Public Education for Vibrant, mental, vibrant Emotional Health, to develop training for the Investigations Division to learn additional skills for effective call management, face-to-face -face communication skills, including active listening, emphatic response, and the mechanics of making a warm transfer to NYC Well, and the steps, as, uh, and steps an investigator should take when civilian presents an imminent risk to um, the public or to him or herself. Additionally, Investigators learn how to engage civilians in conversations about mental wellness, including how to introduce NYC Well into conversations. Further, in accordance with the best practices recommended by service providers to victims of violence, the agency recently began providing forensic experiential trauma interview, that's FETI training, to, investi to the investigations division. This type of interview technique allows for interviewing complainants and victims in ways that empower them, providing investigators with, the, with better information and complainants with a more productive and caring experience at the CCRB. Approximately 17% approximately of the complaints received in 2018 in the CCRB's jurisdiction involve complainants and victims between the ages of 14 and 24. Young people, particularly young people of color, have a disproportionately higher likelihood of contact with police. The agency has begun a number of new initiatives aimed at giving younger complainants and victims a voice in how the CCRB investigates, prosecutes, and reports on police youth interactions. In December 2018, the CCRB selected 20 New Yorkers between the ages of 11 and 24 year years old to be members of its inaugural Youth Advisory Council following an open citywide um, application process. This group, which meets quarterly, advises the agency on its policies and outreach efforts to young members of the public. One of the Youth Advisory Council's current tasks is to work with agency staff to facilitate an event on February 26, 2019, entitled Speak Up, Speak Out, a youth summit on policing in New York. This summit will include panels of youth activists and advocates 
and breakout groups to discuss the types of interactions young people report having with police in New York and brainstorming on next steps for police accountability efforts in this area. From this summit, the CCRB hopes to gain insight into aspects of police youth relations to inform an upcoming policy unit report on complaints the agency receives from people ages 14 to 24. The CCRB is committed to providing strong, effective, and independent civilian oversight for the New York City Police Department and to continue leading the way in civilian oversight nationally. Thank you for your time and your support, and the members of the executive staff and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank, Thank you. you for your testimony. Um, and I guess I'll begin with, uh, so let's start with some vocabulary. Uh, what does it mean to substantiate a case? When the agency substantiates a case, it means that it is determined that it is more likely than not that the allegation made by the civilian occurred and that what was alleged was misconduct. And so it's fair to say that only substantiated cases can wind up in discipline being imposed? Correct. Okay. What percentage of cases are substantiated? Roughly 20% of the uh, cases within the agency's jurisdiction that are fully investigated are substantiated. So even last year, uh, out of the number you had, you would say the average was around 20% that was substantiated. Yes. And that seems to be pretty low. Is there a reason for that? What would you attribute that to? The agency takes each case on its merits and looks at the evidence that's available in each case that it has. Uh, when when it has a preponderance of the evidence that it is more likely or not that the actions alleged by the complainant occurred and that what occurred was misconduct, we substantiate that allegation. There, there is some times where the, we are able to determine that the conduct occurred but was not misconduct. We exonerate cases in, those, in, in that instance. That Can you does give not, an example of that? Uh, if someone were to make a complaint that, the, that they were stopped inappropriately on the street and the agency would do an investigation and determine uh, after speaking to the civilian, to other witnesses, reviewing the police paperwork and then interviewing the police officers that the conduct occurred, that the individual was indeed stopped by the police, but that the police had the requisite level of suspicion to conduct that stop, then we would exonerate that conduct. All right. Um, let's get into discipline a little bit. So if I understand correctly, CCRB civilian staff conducts the actual investigation and collection of evidence and board members make the decision as whether to substantiate. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. And then take me through what happens once a case is substantiated. Once the board determines whether or not to substantiate the allegation against an officer in the, in the board panel process, uh, they go through, as the chair described in his testimony, the framework that we are using to determine what level of discipline to recommend to the police department in substantiated cases. There are five levels of discipline that can be uh, recommended to the department. The lowest level is command level instruction. Uh, that is where a uh, supervisor of the member of service in question instructs them on what they did wrong and how not to do it in the future. The and next, that's the local precinct commander would handle that? Generally, it, generally speaking, yes. Is there any cases where you find it's not the commander or, or someone so else? It, it depends on the, the, the rank of the officer. Okay. So, for example, if it's a senior officer who's getting instructions, it might not be from the, their direct supervisor. The, uh, the next highest level is, is formalized training, which involves uh, formal classroom setting training, whether at the academy or at one police plaza on, on the, that should be aimed directly at the misconduct that was substantiated. The next highest level, level of discipline is a Schedule A command discipline. A Schedule A command discipline is automatically removed from the officer's uh, central personnel index after a year and can result in a penalty of between uh, a reprimand, 
all the way up to forfeiture of five vacation days. A Schedule B command discipline is the next highest level of discipline that can be recommended. That uh, the penalty involved in that can range from a reprimand to forfeiture of 10 vacation days. And that uh, after three years, the member of service can ask for that to be taken off their central personnel index, but, but the, uh, <laughs> but it does not, the department does not have to. Someone is seeing the light today. <laughs> Go ahead. The, uh, the highest level of discipline that the board can recommend is charges and specifications that uh, in those cases, those are prosecuted by the APU. Those result in administrative charges being filed against members of service. Uh, and then the, the administrative prosecution unit brings them through the full disciplinary process at the department. And what method does the board use to decide what the appropriate level of discipline is? Are there guidelines? So the, the board is currently in the middle of a pilot program regarding uh, how it recommends discipline. We are using a framework that, is, uh, that, that serves as a series of guidelines as to what uh, discipline, sh whether or not charges and specifications should be imposed on the member of service who had misconduct substantiated. And take me through the pilot a little bit. So the, the board found six, uh, six allegations that kind of the initial level of, of uh, level of review to determine whether or not charges would be uh, warranted in a case. And those are uh, force with injury, strip search, chokehold, uh, entry uh, to a home or place of business, uh, offensive language, and sexual misconduct. The, those, are, those are generally speaking, they war those allegations warrant charges. The next level of review is to look at the officer's uh, CCRB history and to see if they have prior misconduct uh, substantiated against them uh, and if that misconduct especially was uh, similar to what has been substantiated in the case that they're determining. And then the final level of review is to just look at the totality of the circumstances because there may be some factors uh, in a case that, that it wouldn't appear on its face to warrant charges, but some aspect, for example, if it involved a particularly vulnerable civilian, if they were young or uh, in a vulnerable group might warrant uh, charges and specifications where otherwise uh, lesser discipline would have seemed to be appropriate. And also there are, there are times where the totality of the circumstances, there's, it would appear that charges and specifications are warranted, but the, the board has determined that in this particular case, they, they did not warrant charges and specifications. So let's uh, let me follow up on that. So let's so you go through and you you come up with disciplinary recommendations. I just want to hear a little bit more structure of how the board is. So when you vote on these things, does it have to be a unanimous? Does it have to be unanimous amongst so, board members? So how does that work? The vast majority of the complaints that are heard by the board are actually heard by panels of three board members. Every panel consists of one uh, mayoral designee, one city council designee and one police commissioner designee. And you said, you had, uh, sorry to cut you off, so th and you said three panels. So each panel has each, three members. Three members, each panel. Okay. And one from each designating authority is on every panel. And the, the, uh, the panels rotate, so there are no set panels. And there's a majority vote usually uh, that gets um, a recommendation forward it to the department. And when you recommend command discipline to the DAO, what happens if they disagree with your recommendations? So in those cases, the department generally files a reconsideration request and uh, we review those reconsideration requests and then uh, respond. And uh, if the board keeps its original determination, then the department has to decide whether to impose 
discipline or t it can it can take it can decide not to take the board's recommendation and impose its own level of discipline or no discipline at all and how often do they agree that the officers need discipline so in 75 percent of cases where it is not an APU level case where it's either command discipline or some kind of training involved the department agrees with the CCRB's recommendation and imposes some kind of discipline. So they impose some type of discipline. Um, can you speak to how often they agree with the actual amount of discipline uh, that you recommend? I, th I think that's roughly 50% of the time. So only 50% of the time they agree, and, and, and in a case that they don't agree, can you just take me through some examples of how they, how much more you minimize the discipline, they minimize the discipline that you might have recommended? So if you said 10 vacation days, how do, is it a negotiation, do they? So, so with regard to uh, non-APU cases, the board does not recommend the level of penalty. So it just recommends the level of discipline. So the, the board recommends a command discipline, but it doesn't specify what level of penalty should be associated with that command discipline. So and when we say 75% of the time, it means if we recommend a command discipline, the board is either recommending, a, uh, the department is imposing either a command discipline or some kind of training on the member of service. And when officers take a plea administered by the police department, uh, does the CCRB still make a recommendation of discipline? So officers make rec officers plead guilty in APU cases. In those cases, the, the board substantiated misconduct, recommended that the particular member of service uh, face charges and specifications. The, uh, the administrative prosecution unit filed, un, uh, filed charges and specifications against that member of service. The department serves the charges and specifications on the member of service. They are then brought before uh, an administrative law judge who's employed by the police department. They're in a, either the deputy commissioner of trials herself or an assistant deputy commissioner of trials. And in the cases where they plead guilty, the APU has recommended penalty to the administrative, uh, to the deputy commissioner of trials or one of her assistants, and the member of service pleads guilty to that recommended penalty. But the police commissioner is the final arbiter of discipline, and uh, he can sometimes reduce the penalty, or he can uh, sometimes uh, reduce the level of discipline, set aside the plea, reduce the, uh, dismiss the charges and file some other kind of discipline against the member of service, or sometimes he can impose no discipline at all. Right, and um, I guess that's the million dollar question. So often we get the question of, well, we have the CCRB, um, but the police commissioner at the end of the day can still uh, overturn a guilty plea. Um, how often does that happen? We'll get back to you with that. Uh, Mr. On. Chair, I, I, I should it. have it, but I don't. So, I apologize uh, to you. So last year, how many times would you say that happened? So you, is it a dozen? I hope we can find that number. I want to hear that number. Okay, you'll just state your name for the record. If oh, you're gonna. sorry, uh, okay. Mr. Chair. Uh, Jonathan Darsh, I'm the executive director of the CCRB, and oh, you don't have to say it over again. And I, in, if she uh, was going to speak, she would have. Said. And the uh, in four percent of the cases in the first half of 2018, in which the police commissioner finalized discipline in an APU case, uh, he set aside the plea but imposed some form of discipline, and in 33 percent of the time. Uh, 
he 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 kept the he kept the same level of discipline. He kept charges and specifications, but reduced the penalty. And just to put it in raw numbers, that was in one case where he set a lower level of discipline, and in eight cases where the penalty was uh, reduced. And in 2018, there were there were no cases where uh, he did not impose discipline when there was a plea. When there was a plea. Correct. In 2018, none of the cases, there was no discipline at all. Is that less than prior years? Yes. And can you take me through, just roughly take me through those numbers again? So from maybe if you can start from 2016 to 2017? In, in 2016, there were four cases uh, in which the police commissioner set aside a plea and imposed no discipline, which is roughly 2% of the cases that the APU handled. And then in 2017, there were three cases where the police commissioner set aside a plea and imposed no discipline. And is the CCRB permitted to share the police commissioner's final decision of discipline with victims and complainants? Yes, the CCRB, it's, it's a relatively new practice, but now we, in addition to sending disposition letters to civilians at the conclusion of the CCRB investigation, we now send uh, disposition letters to the complainants uh, at the conclusion of the NYPD's disciplinary process, both in APU cases and in non-APU cases. And how do complainants respond when they believe the police commissioner's chosen discipline is insufficient? Uh, they're, they generally, when people are unhappy with that result. Say that again, I'm sorry? Generally, people are unhappy with that result. And, and how do they, so they're generally unhappy and there's no recourse for them? Correct. They, they, sometimes they will contact the agency and we will explain to them the process, but if they feel that it was insufficient, uh, just understanding the process isn't enough for them to feel better about the process. All right. I'm gonna come back with more questions. I'm gonna go to council members uh, Menchaca, then uh, Deutsch. Thank you. I, I want to start at the top and, and really kind of put this into context and we really rely on you all as a CCRB to be independent and to investigate and can, the line of question really kind of points to this idea of data that shows us some troubling trends. And I kind of want to get some sense of, of some of those trends and since 2014, how many officers have you uh, or have, sorry, how many officers have been fired from the NYPD as a result of CCRB investigations and prosecutions? Do you, do you have that data? None. No. Is that no, data? No. None. Zero. So, got it. So, no, no one has been fired in relationship to a CCRB investigation? Correct. Okay. Correct. So, given the low number of cases, zero, that the CCRB advocates and charges, uh, uh, advocates the charges and specifications, it can be argued that the message to the public is that police abuse is being protected by the city's independent watchdog agency. So why doesn't CCRB seek termination of abusive officers more often? Because there's two questions here. One, how many have, and then how many have you actually pursued? Um, can you talk a little bit about, about those two um, components, seeking termination and then effectively bringing termination forward? Just so so, council member, before John uh, provide, the executive director provides those stats, mm -hmm. I'd just like to comment on this notion that the independent agency could be perceived as protecting uh, police officers. Uh, and I'd just like to remind the council that the members of this board are actually designated by uh, public officials. Um, and are committed to pursuing um, allegations against members of the NYPD with um, as much rigor and independence as the statutes allow. And, and, and we do that. Um, I think the, the issues that we faced are more rooted in 
the statutes that currently exist, particularly around uh, final determination, uh, much more than they are around the rigor that the staff and the board uh, brings to this process. So I'd just like to offer that alternative perspective on whether or not the agency is actually protecting members of the NYPD, because I think we work hard not to do that, but to be fair and rigorous and aggressive uh, in our efforts to be an independent, independent civilian um, oversight agency. With, uh, with regard to the number of times we've recommended termination, uh, I'd, I'd have to get back to you on that. We don't have that with us today, uh, but it, it, is, it is not a large number of cases that I, I, I am confident of saying. When the, the APU is determining what penalty to recommend in its cases, it looks at the severity of the alleged misconduct, the, the officer's uh, CCRB history and their uh, and their NYPD his disciplinary history, as well as the case precedent for what has been imposed for similar misconduct in the past by uh, either this police commissioner or other police commissioners. And, uh, and that's how we form our penalty recommendations. Got it. And OK, I'm, and I have some other questions that I think kind of speak to the larger issue. But to uh, just quickly respond to your, I think what is, what feels very uncomfortable, right? It just, it's like, wow, I, I said something not only provocative, but I think what people feel on the ground, including myself, members of this committee potentially. And so that's real. And, and I know that you're responding with a sense of, of like, um, of mission that you have. And I have no doubt that you have that mission across the board. What's important though is that we, we hit that head on with data. And that's why I'm asking for the data that I'm asking for. And no matter what you think, is real for you, there's a other reality that is out there. And that's what we're trying to confront. Um, so let's talk about uh, the New York State Law 50A. And you know, advocates argue that the, the 50A shields abusive officers and police discipline in, in a shroud of secrecy. Um, in the cases of Eric Gardner and Graham, leaked records show that officers in both cases had prior misconduct complaints, and for a period of time, the CCRB provided summaries of the complaints upon request. However, this ended in 2016 when the city turned the clock backwards on MIPD transparency by instituting a new policy of hiding misconduct and discipline histories of officers. Um, with regard to 50A, the city's law department represents both NYPD and CCRB. Doesn't this present a conflict of interest and would the CCRB be open to seeking independent counsel? Period. Question mark. <laughs> so I think it, we should make clear um, that um, it, has, it was never the CCRB's practice to provide information on individual officers' dispositions. You're talking about the summaries? Sorry to interrupt. You're, you're talking about the summaries. We did aggregate summaries, yeah. Okay. We, but, and we still do aggregate presentations of data. The information on individual officers, if I understand it correctly, came from the NYPD and not from the CCRB. And that process would not change for us with a, ref, with a change in 50A, which we, in keeping with both the mayor and the police commissioner's position support. And, and that's just a function of that they have that position. If the position changed, then your position would change as a function of their, your relationship to them? I, no, I think that we would maintain the current level of confidentiality in order to be, um, in order to be, to do our work. But we would certainly encourage the NYPD if the law were changed, obviously to make that information public because I think we believe it's, it's important to the public to have it. Okay, again, this, this is where there's, there's a real conflict and tension of practice of independence and that's problematic. I have one more question. Yeah, cool. Just tell me when to stop. <laughs> one more question, okay. <laughs> I just wanna be clear. Um, that's problematic, that's problematic. And I think for a few reasons, and, and I think the, the question that I landed, ended with was independent counsel, and would you be able to seek independent counsel? Uh, 
I'm sorry, Council Member. Uh, I don't know if you want to share anything. Yeah, I just wanted to clear up um, that if 50A were changed, we would make information on individual officers public. That's what I thought, um, which is different what, what you just said. Correct. Got it. Okay. Independent counsel, is that at all in your world a possibility uh, in, in, in terms of just the larger questions, this question, seeking independent counsel rather than using the city's counsel, who's also protecting agents that you're trying to be independent from? So we have had that discussion. We haven't felt it necessary to do it. Okay. We might differ on that. Right. Uh, final question. There's more questions, but the chair's so um, gracious in allowing me to ask the, the last question, which is, Really thinking about over the years, a dis disturbing and consistent trend has been that a percentage of the CCRB cases, the officer responsible for the misconduct cannot be identified. Um, and that they, these are amongst the CCRB complaints that are fully investigated. In the first half of the 2018, 8% 8, 8 of fully investigated cases were closed without identifying officers responsible for misconduct. So what's caused this uh, to continue to be a persistent problem and what are the examples of the role NYPD has played in helping to identify abusive officers or obstructing identification of these officers? So uh, the agency prides itself on its ability to identify officers. If, if a civilian makes a complaint to the agency, it does not need to know the name or shield of the member of service if you come to us with a complaint, we strive to identify the officers responsible so that if the conduct is substantiated, we could, uh, we could make sure they, we could recommend discipline against that member of service. But one of the, there are some times where it is impossible to figure out who is the, actually the individual that is responsible for the misconduct. Uh, and, and while, it's, while I agree with you, 8% is too high, the same way that the truncation rate is too high, we are always looking to reduce it. Uh, it is not because the, the agency is not taking it very seriously or assigning resources to it. It just sometimes in these situations where, for example, there's a melee and there are multiple officers involved, finding out who did the exact strike is difficult. So Okay, I, I feel like you're not answering the question about the 8%. It's too, I, we both agree that it's high, but, and then you're saying well, there's a whole bunch of reasons why. And I don't know if you're gonna be able to answer it anyway, but I'm just letting you know that's a real, that's a, that's a problem. That's a real problem. And unless you, we get a better sense about that 8%, and maybe we can give us data on that, 20, just look at 2018, how many cases? Was this a case of multiple officers? We, we gotta know something, because right now that darkness, uh, that void of information is tro troubling to everything can, else that's connected. We could get you that, Mr. Okay, uh, great. So there's some data requests that would be great to get to the chair of the committee sure. on, on my questions before. Thank you. And that's you, a Chair. good segue into, just before I get to Councilmember Deutsch, what do you say to people, and I think there's this perception and argument that the CCRB has no teeth, or that they ask, you know, what's the point in going through with the complaint if the police commissioner at the end of the day is gonna have the final call? So what, what, what are some things that, you know, you recommend as law, as we're lawmakers, obviously, um, that we can do to help strengthen your efforts and ensuring that accountability is happening and, and I, obviously the question around 50A, I'm sure there'll be a lot more conversations around that in Albany, I predict. Um, but what, you know, what could we do as lawmakers to help strengthen your office at this point? Sure, so um, we are um, continuing our efforts to address um, what we see as some challenges in our process. We've talked about truncations and, and the executive director can talk to you in more detail about the effort staff are currently taking to reduce the number of truncations and that's involved and it's a very um, elaborate process. Um, it is really important for us that um, when people bring a complaint that they stay with it and it's important for us to help them stay with that complaint. 
Um, I think if we can bring that, the truncation numbers down, which we're w really working on, uh, it will increase confidence uh, in the agency uh, uh, to do its work. I think greater uh, concurrence between the NYPD, both on the need for discipline uh, when it, uh, when a, when a um, allegation is substantiated and the type of discipline once it's substantiated, uh, greater concurrence there would increase that confidence. And we're working with the NYPD and the police commissioner to um, address those issues. So I think those are two areas where we can work more closely. Again, at the end of the day, and it's a matter of law, uh, the commissioner uh, has the final word on, on discipline, um, and that's just a reality that we work with that. Right, and just, you know, I, I mean, and, and it's of my opinion, you know, I think that we should be doing more to ensure that, um, how do I say this correctly, but politically correctly, that the police commissioner doesn't have as much discretion in this conversation as he does um, now. So figuring out ways to um, ensure that, you know, accountability can actually happen, opening up that process, um, you know, 50A, so a culmination of different things to strengthen you. Because at the end of the day, as we talk about building trust with the public and and creating a real avenue, a meaningful avenue for people to file complaints to hold those officers accountable who uh, break the code of CPR, you know, um, you know, we have a long way to go. So um, you're in a tough spot. <laughs> um, because once again, at the end of the day, you could recommend penalties, individuals being held accountable, but with the police commissioner having the final say so, we really um, weaken you know, a discipline process that we believe should be strengthened. That being said, I'm gonna go to Councilmember Deutsch and then come back for more questions. And Cohen, Deutsch and Cohen. Thank you, thank you very much, Chair. Um, so firstly, if, if someone um, receives an ACD for a criminal case, would that, to your knowledge, would that stay on someone's record? So a Schedule A command discipline or yeah. an adjournment? An adjournment. Completion of dismissal. Yeah, an adjournment. So it's my experience that those are generally sealed after six months or a year, depending on the type of uh, ACD that is issued, but it would, it would still be on their ar arrest record. That they would, it would, would it be? I, it depends on the level of access that the person that the person doing the search has. Yeah, because usually, um, usually, uh, most cases will get closed. That means it will be sealed, right? So if the person applies for a job or for a uh, promotion at a job, you know, and if someone tends to look into it, that that would be sealed. Um, to my understanding, um, an officer who has a, a CCRB filed against him or her, does that stay on the record? Or yeah. if someone is exonerated? Yes, the exoneration would remain on their record, but so, as exonerated. So, so what would be the difference between someone receiving an ACD and that record would be sealed and an officer who becomes exonerated why would that still remain in the record? Because one is a, a criminal allegation and the other is an administrative claim that is someone's disciplinary history. In addition, if, you, if, if someone gets arrested and their prints are run, the fact that they previously received an ACD is on the rap sheet. I, I apologize for not knowing the proper term. That's given to the district attorney, the court, and, and the NYPD. So it's not as if it is totally eliminated from, from existence, it's still on their record. So, and if someone is, an officer is exonerated, right, they're not taking the prints, they're not going through all those same things. So why would that uh, remain on the record uh, for the, the rest of that officer's career? And number two is that, what is your opinion? I mean, I believe in fairness. And I agree what the chair has spoken before. If someone 
um, has uh, um, allegations against an office, and they follow CCAB, and the office is found guilty, that they have to take um, um, proper um, you know, action against that officer. But what is your personal opinion, as the chair, what is your personal opinion, um, in fairness, that if an officer is exonerated, should that remain on his or her records um, throughout his or her career? I do think it's important for us to have the history of an officer's relationship with uh, the CCRB um, as we um, adjudicate um, complaints and allegations against that officer. So I think that's important information for us to have. So it's important for CCRB. Now, do you give that information um, to the NYPD? If so, when a, when a member of service uh, has has an exoneration that is not forwarded to the NYPD as a disciplinary case, it's not sent to the Department Advocate's Office. The so it's sent to the NYPD. It is not sent to the NYPD. It is it is not. A, finding of, of misconduct. It is kept in the CCRB's database. There are a little, there have been a, several cases where we will refer a matter to NYPD's Bureau of Risk Management, uh, in which we find cases where officers have acted within guidelines, but perhaps need retraining on something or uh, misstated the law in an interview so that they could receive the benefit of not making this same mistake on the street. So for example, if someone comes in and is a witness officer and describes their understanding of the law for, of when to search someone or when to enter someone's home improperly, we will let the department know so they can correct that person's understanding of what the law properly is. Also, we may find incidents where the officer has behaved within guidelines, but we have an issue with the guideline, and when, so we will refer the matter. Uh, generally, we wait till there's more of a body of evidence, uh, more than just one case, where we'll refer something to the department and say, the, this is something you should look at. So that information is kept um, by the CCRB, so it's not shared typically with the department, you're saying? Correct. Unless it's necessary. So before a officer gets promotion, uh, promoted, um, or um, does the NYPD ever like reach out to CCRB and to ask, okay, was there any uh, complaints against this officer, even those that were exonerated? You, you know, Councilmember, I've heard this before that somehow having an open CCRB or a sub CCRB can somehow impact your. Uh, promotional chances or transfer chances, but when I was the deputy chief prosecutor and chief prosecutor of the APU, routinely I would see officers, uh, their, their representation would change because they had either been promoted or transferred, so they would have a new union and new attorneys provided. So my, I don't know, I can't speak to the departmental process other than my understanding is it, it had no effect on their, or it did not prevent them from getting promoted or transferred. So that's, that's um, uh, but it's not, you, you're not speaking for the NYPD. Correct. So does it, is there ever time that the NYPD would call you up, um, like a year later, asking you, okay, give me some information on this officer regarding any CCRB complaints, and if, let's say, you had one or two and both of them were exonerated, um, would you be mandated to give that information over to the NYPD? So so the NYPD has the ability to pull up an officer's uh, uh, CCRB history. But you're saying that they don't have the information because you don't share everything with them. But they, they can, so we would so they not have, prefer. So they have the same system, they could go in your system? They have, we provide access to compl our database in a limited manner, and they have the ability to uh, pr create for themselves officer disciplinary history without requesting it from us 
So if you're saying before you said that you don't share this information, but now you're saying that they do have access to this information. So you really don't have to share it if they have the access to that information. But the NY, we do not refer cases the way we would a substantiated case. We do not refer exonerated cases to the Department Advocate's Office. Yeah, but if someone's exonerated, they wouldn't have to go to the Public Advocate's Office anyway. Cor right? Mr. Councilman, I, I, I don't understand what you're asking there. Um, if someone is exonerated on a complaint, right, that complaint would not have to go, would anyway not have to go to the public advocate's office, correct? Correct. Because there was no, the, the, nothing was, the, was unfounded. Department advocate's office. Is yeah, that department referring? advocate's office, yeah. Um, because it was unfounded and there's no, nothing no, substantiated. Mr. Councilman, uh, it's an unfounded complaint is not the same as an exonerated complaint. An okay, I'm talking about exonerated, exonerated. But if, just for, if I could explain to, for everyone to understand, an unfounded complaint is when the agency is able to determine by a preponderance of the evidence that the conduct alleged did not occur. Exonerated means that the conduct occurred the officer did what the civilian said they did. It's just that it was within guidelines. So the officer didn't commit misconduct, but the officer did what the civilian said they did. Got it, so does an unfounded complaint um, stay in the officer's record? Yes. Just as exonerated, so he's just said unfounded means that there was nothing substantiated, like totally nothing substantiated, right? It, the agency was able to determine by the preponderance of the evidence that misconduct alleged did not occur. So why, why does that, the unfounded, stay in the record if it's unfounded? Do you it's agree that an unfounded complaint, before you said exonerated, it's something CCRB needs to know, that information is important, but unfounded, is that, do you feel the same way, that an unfounded complaint is something you need to know? Yes, because we also right. keep track of the civilian's CCRB history, and so if, the, if we were to not keep track of unfounded complaints, then we wouldn't know if the civilian had made an unfounded complaint in the past. So you hold the records to hold against the complainant, in other words. We, we, that means we don't you, hold the records that to hold saying? it against anyone, Mr. Councilman. We hold the records because that's what happened at the CCRB, and we have an obligation as a government entity to keep an accurate count of our records in the same way that the, 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 pol the police department keeps track of when someone had an arrest that was sealed, the, uh, the New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services still knows if someone got an ACD or had a case dismissed. The CCRB needs to know if someone had a, a member of service had a complaint filed against them and it was unfounded or that allegation was uh, uh, exonerated. It's it's just a matter of record keeping. There's no there's no intent behind it. There's no. There, it's just keeping a full count of what we do. So if someone is guilty, if someone is uh, uh, um, so there's allegations against someone for a criminal complaint. Guy goes to court. No AC. Totally unfounded. Dismissed. Case dismissed. As to your knowledge, does that is that stay on, on the person's record? So when I was a DA yeah. and I would get someone's rap sheet and someone had a case dismissed against them, it yeah. was still showing up as dismissed. It would still see the arrest and then the disposition would be Would dismissed. it stay on their criminal record? That's that's their criminal. If there's, there's no criminal, there's no criminality there, right? But it's in the same way that it's in the CCRB system. It never gets and sealed? History, it may be sealed but someone still has the, the underlying complaint in their system. When yeah. You're not going into the DCJS and removing the fact that the person had an arrest. So in your idea, was that, is that information that if someone's found not guilty, is that information ever shared with someone else? Or does someone else ever have access to your computers to, to obtain that information from your experience? From my experience, if someone were to file, if a, there was a so ordered subpoena for a member of services uh, disciplinary history, we will provide that disciplinary history to the court. Okay, um, I think my time is up, but uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chair Richards. Uh, Thank you for your testimony. Uh, let me just say as a preliminary matter, though, uh, I do think that the 
that, that here in the city that we, we are ahead of the curve, I think, in terms of the, uh, the public's confidence in, uh, in police officers. I think police officers, I think that uh, examples of misconduct are relatively low compared, you know, obviously there's no comparable size force, but I think on a per capita base. But I, I also agree with the chair here that I think that there are statutory and structural problems with CCRB. I don't think that the pu general public has great confidence in CCRB. Uh, and I, again, I'm not here to beat you up. I don't. I think that you probably are doing the best you can with the resources and the structure that you have. Uh, but just sort of, I think, to uh, buttress the case a little bit, could you just tell me briefly what the, what the duration is? I make a complaint on day one. Uh, assuming I don't disappear, I want to see it all the way through. What is the average amount of time it takes for you to take a case from beginning, I guess a substantiated case, so that we sort of have a... So in 2018, it took roughly 190 days for us to fully investigate uh, a substantiated case. That time is, has been an increase uh, that reflects an increase that we were able to determine is, is a result of body-worn camera footage. Body-worn camera footage is a huge boon to our investigations. It gives us not only video but audio in many cases. That is very helpful in reaching determinations. But it, is, it causes an increase in the length of time to fully investigate a case. Even if there's just one video, if it's five minutes long, it's not just adding five minutes of investigative time. You have to request the video. You have to receive it from NYPD. Then you have to watch it. Oftentimes, you watch it multiple times so that you can uh, break down exactly what is pictured in the video. The, the, we, we, in 2018, started using software to let us analyze video, not just body-worn camera video, but all video, so that we can better understand what's happening in the video and, and make better determinations from having the video. So the, that is a, a, a main, that, that is, I think, one of the main uh, in increasing pressures on our investigative times. I just want to be clear that I understand your answer. So a little more than six months, if I come into your CCRB, make my complaint, in six months, that, that, that assuming it's a substantiated case, that there will be resolution. That the CCRB will have, the panel or the full board will have met and issued a determination, yes. And I think you answered this already or it came up in, a, in a, an answer, but the, the burden of proof is preponderance of the evidence? Correct. Uh, you talked also a little bit about sexual misconduct. Obviously, officer on officer sexual misconduct is not in, within your jurisdiction. Uh, the CCRB's... Well, Jurisdiction includes when, when a member of service is alleged to have committed misconduct against an off-duty member of service. So we would have jurisdiction over that case, but if it's on-duty, uh, if it's on-duty against on-duty or off-duty versus on-duty, on then we would not have jurisdiction. Does, does that ever happen? Do you ever get I would, I would have to, to check. It doesn't happen frequently. Correct. Uh, how do you, uh, for, for as a layperson, uh, when does excessive force, uh, where's the line between excessive force and assault? Like, how do you know that you have jurisdiction, uh, that it's not a criminal matter? So there's concurrent jurisdiction. If, the, if there is a criminal matter that the, uh, where excessive force we don't have to determine whether or not it is criminal conduct or not, uh, unless there's the, the small time where we have to decide whether or not the crime exception to the statute of limitation applies. And even then, we were not really looking at whether the act occurred was criminal or not. We're just act, looking to see whether it could be pled as a crime. The, the, uh, it's up to the district attorney's offices to determine whether or not criminal conduct, or in some cases, the attorney general. Uh, will you know if the, ca if the case is being investigated by the DA, will you sort of stand down and wait or? So if either the DA or the Attorney General or a U.S. Attorney requests that we stand down, uh, we, we call it DA hold. So we will hold off on our investigation and we will wait until 
uh, we are informed by the prosecutor's office that it, we are cleared to, to go forward. We, we have changed our procedures, I would say, in the last year and a half to make sure that we are affirmatively checking every month to make sure that the hold is still in place so that we don't waste time where we could be investigating a case and, uh, and, and making them stretch out. If you were the first point of contact for a complainant and the allegation suggested uh, a crime, would you notify the DA? So in, uh, in cases now where we are receiving complaints that are phase two allegations, that are allegations of sexual assault, we are referring them to the DA's offices. You are. As a matter of course. Um, and we do that before we begin any investigation. We don't look into whether or not it had any merit to it. We just, we receive that type of allegation and we refer it to the relevant DA's office. Just cause I, I'm, I'm sure that it was clear, it's just that I, I don't, I think I have the background. Could you just explain to me, the, the APU is CCRB or is NYPD? The APU is CCRB. It was created after a 2012 memorandum of understanding between the CCRB and the NYPD. It is the only uh, unit of its type in the nation. We are, we, we are responsible for prosecute, administratively prosecuting the, I sometimes say we because I used to be the, the, in the APU, the uh, administratively prosecuting charges against members of service who have had misconduct substantiated by the board and the board recommended they face charges and specifications. Chair, I just have one more question. If, if the, do all cases where you have jurisdiction go to, like what if there's no, the department, what if Commissioner O'Neill thinks that an officer needs to be disciplined? They, they don't need to go to CCRB. They could just discipline the officer on their, does that ever, I mean? So there, there are times where the department will refer cases to us. Uh, there are times where when we, and, and I would have to check to get you the, the exact number of cases, it's not a large number, where we have substantiated misconduct against the member of service, and, and then before we were able to inform the department, they had already taken disciplinary action against the member of service. Uh, I would be interested in those numbers. I, that's probably not a great way to proceed. I think, it, I don't think it's, sort of respectful to the, to, the, to the board members at CCRB, the people doing their work, if you, know, you do the work and then it turns out uh, NYPD is like, never mind, we already handled it. That's probably not a great uh, uh, outcome or a satisfying outcome for anybody. So if you, if you could get that, uh, that information, I think it would be helpful. We'll get it for you. And uh, if, thank you, Chair. Thank you, and I think that was a good question. And, um, you know, and we wanna know what that level of discipline was, even if it could, so is there a way for you to get that information to us as well? because we don't really believe that the police department should be policing itself necessarily. Otherwise, there would be no need for the CCRB. Um, let me just go back into the APU um, again. So um, my understanding is that the APU is preparing to prosecute Officer Pantaleo this year. Um, can you tell us when that will happen and why it has taken so long? So I, I think I can only talk to what's been publicly reported. Uh, there is a hearing in front of DCT Maldonado scheduled for January 31st, and at the last, uh, the last hearing date, she also set trial dates in May and June that I should know the, the exact dates, but I do not. And what took so long? Uh, the, there was uh, initially the Richmond County District Attorney's Office asked the agency to hold on its uh, investigation. CCRB and, is the agency, correct? So yes, sorry. The, uh, my apologies. The Richmond County DA's Office placed the CCRB's investigation of the incident on DA hold. And then the uh, Eastern District of New York uh, placed the case on 
DA hold, even though they're not exactly DAs. And then finally, Central Justice had the case on hold as well uh, when the case had gone to them. Uh, and then uh, even after the CCRB, the, and, and it wasn't until uh, that DA hold came off when? I, I'd have to get back to you on the exact date. I don't remember. Okay. The, uh, but I know that the NYPD finally served Officer Panaleo, uh, I want to say, in, in August of, in, in summer of 2018. And we had an initial uh, hearing date a couple of months ago. Uh, and the reason for the delay since, the, uh, since Officer Panaleo was served uh, this is, this is I, I don't want to get too much into the, the case with at bar because of 50, 50A. Um, I'm going to move on to the next incident, uh, but this, this is taking too long. Pantaleo should be gone. Uh, illegal chokehold should be gone. Um, after the Jasmine Headley incident at the HRA office, the NYPD chose not to discipline the officers involved. Is there a role that uh, you're playing in this case? And can you speak to it if you determine that there was misconduct? And can the commissioner disregard your recommendations? So the CCRB has an open investigation into this matter. Uh, and then I can't speak further on the individual Headley case, but I can talk generally speaking about what happens if the CCRB substantiates something and, for example, IAB has unsubstantiated or exonerated that conduct. If you, generally speaking, we're, we're allowed to go forward with our process, and then the commissioner has to determine uh, whether or not to issue discipline or not. And the commissioner can disregard your uh, specific recommendations, correct? Correct, but the commissioner could also decide to discipline uh, an officer based on the information that we present to the commissioner. Right, and I think he's publicly said that uh, you know, in this particular incident, I'm not sure. Well, we, going we should further. not, the, yes, this agency but, can't come. Okay, got it. All righty. Um, and so this leads me to the big million dollar question. You know, what do you say to people who argue that, once again, you have no teeth? And what's the point in going through your, your process if the commissioner can disregard uh, your specific recommendations? So, Mr. Chair, I would say that um, we are. Um, probably one of the, if not the, um, strongest independent oversight board in the country. Uh, we've made great strides in independent civilian oversight. We clearly have a long way to go uh, in terms of our being the kind of optimum agency that um, this city and other people here uh, would, would desire. But again, you know, part of this is structural, uh, and it's a, it's a matter of law. And um, uh, at the end of the day, there is a final arbiter when it comes to, or final decision maker when it comes to police discipline. We will, again, um, I heard Council Member Menchaca, we, but we will pursue this with all the energy and vigor and expertise that we can bring to bear. We will always be knocking on this door and the door of the administration for more resources to do that. We take, we consider it a particular honor, I think I speak for my fellow board members, to be able to do this work. Proud to be appointed by elected officials, to be responsible to those elected officials and be responsible to the public. Uh, it's a, it's a, we have a really dedicated staff that uh, comes to work and works hard every day, uh, and we think we're the best the country has at the moment, but there's always opportunities to be better. Um, but we thank you for your support, the opportunities to do this work. We're gonna take a two minute recess, and I'm just gonna go next door and vote, and I'll be right back, so okay. the two minute recess.
All righty, I want to go through the APU unit. A um, few questions on that. So I understand that the trials that are open to the public are open to the public, but that all records, including the transcripts, are not disclosed to the public. Why is the record of a public proceeding shielded from uh, the public's view? Currently, the. Sorry, I should have waited for Leader <laughs> Daniel to come back. He's always so close to me. I thought he was here. <laughs> here ready. You may continue. The current state of 50A of the civil rights law is that an officer's disciplinary record is sealed. Uh, and therefore, even though it is a a, uh, a public proceeding, once it is a record of his, dis of his discipline, it becomes sealed. So this is, it is, it is a, uh, it's why having these public trials is so important. There have been, in the, in the year and a half before the MOU between NYPD and CCRB went into effect, no officer where the CCRB had recommended they receive charges and specifications went to trial. In the uh, time since the MOU has been in effect, more than 370 members of service have had public trials where, the, where they're open to people from the, uh, open to the public to, to come in and see what what is being the evidence that is being proffered against the members of service and their responses to it and I understand uh, and and I think it's a, it's important it's in, it's frankly the only uh, opening into this process that is available for the public and that's why I think the APU one of the reasons why the APU is so important and and one of your your questions has been how can the city council help the CCRB. I think uh, in the 2018 charter revision process, the CCRB recommended uh, codifying the APU. And I think codifying the APU and making it part of the law, enshrining it in the law of this city, would go a long way to uh, making the CCRB stronger and improving public confidence in the CCRB. And I certainly support. Uh, UNO's efforts, and I know we're going through a particular process as well as the council. Um, but following that, you know, once again, you know, so if I, I could watch the trial, correct? I can come as a member of the public and watch, but the records of the public proceeding are still shielded from public view. Uh, is it in your opinion that um, the public disclosure of records and decisions made at department trials would benefit the process? We think the more transparency in this process, the better it's going to be for everybody. So but you would yes. agree that 50A being yeah. repealed is a good thing? I'm sorry? 50A being repealed is a good thing? At least um, being s s seriously revised, yes. And I also understand that the APE only prosecutes cases when the board thinks there's sufficient evidence of misconduct, but it's up to the deputy commissioner of trials to find the officer guilty or not guilty. What is the, uh, the conviction rate for APU cases again? So the, the conviction rate at trial is approximately 50%. Right. And what do you think is driving the discrepancy once again? I think the I think the burden of proof, while uh, I, I think that's a, a very good question. It's something we've been studying a great deal. The and it was something that concerned me greatly when I was deputy chief prosecutor and chief prosecutor of the APU. Uh, I think that the credibility determinations that the board makes in its process 
are sometimes different than the credibility determinations that uh, are made by the deputy commissioner of trials and the assistant deputy commissioner of trials. Haha, uh -huh, no like, shock. <laughs> and, and I'd just like to point out that even when the deputy commissioner of trials or one of her assistants makes, makes a recommend, they also make recommendations to the police commissioner, they are not the final say. It's the police commissioner who's the, the final arbiter in all matters of police discipline. Right. So, you, so would you say that the commissioner, let's imagine, is a form of discipline that you recommend opposed to uh, the DOA? Um, uh, do you find he tends to side with the department or your recommendations more? So, so I can... I think the, the process is, is, is more complicated than that. While the department advocate, uh, the department advocate tends not to s express a, it, from what I can tell, the department advocate is not signing off or in the, in the decision tree, so to speak, where the police commissioner is getting information from the deputy commissioner of trials about uh, How do we know that? Is, I, I, you would have to <laughs> okay. speak to the police, com the uh -huh. police department, exactly what process okay. they follow. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, there, there, anecdotally, I have seen cases recently where the police commissioner has chosen the CCRB's uh, recommendation over uh, another uh, an internal PD recommendation. And I think that's happening. Uh, I, it is my impression. I don't have. I can't. It, it's just uh, anecdotal. So I apologize for that. But it's my impression that there's, there has been more uh, traction. Right. And um, you know, where, where do these trials take place again? In one police plaza at in police headquarters in the. Uh, on the fourth floor in the Deputy Commissioner of Trials office. Uh, so N1PP, so if you had a complaint and you had to go to a trial, you would have to walk through one police plaza. And that, that mm -hmm. is a concern for many of our mm -hmm. witnesses and we take great efforts at the agency to make sure that they, that the civilians who are testifying in their cases are uh, informed of what's going on and brought into the process uh, and and we try and facilitate their par participation in the process as much as possible. But it is it is often intimidating right. to because, have to go to police headquarters mm -hmm. when you've been the victim of police misconduct. Right. And I would assume the purpose of the trial is to for if you if you go on a trial for there to for you to feel like you're in a neutral space that would make you more comfortable. Maybe the percentage rate would go up if people are even a little bit more comfortable. Um, I know there was a proposal at one point floated, I think, to have these at least held at the oath facilities. Uh, so, so the the first, uh, I think the it, the first attempt to create an APU uh, result in the early two thousands resulted in litigation in which it was held that it wasn't proper to have police disciplinary matters held at oath, they had to be internal to the police department. Uh, I think the case was Lynch v. Giuliani. But the, the uh, that, that's just my understanding. Do you think this is something we should look at again? Is this something that we should entertain? So I, it's, I don't know how the law impacts on that. Right now, my understanding of the law is that it has to be internal to the police department, but I, that could change. Okay. Um, all right, I'm going to begin to wrap up just a few more questions. I want to go through the truncated cases. Um, so intro 1106 looks to require additional reporting on cases that are truncated. Uh, can you could describe the situations that result in cases being truncated? And uh, and the decision the board uh, determines. So the the category and are you in support of the bill? So 
my agency uh, was in contact with, with people from your office late last week where we submitted some uh, revisions to the bill. Uh, you know, truncation is something that we take very seriously. We are focused on it. Uh, we, we try and reach out to civilians within the, we, the deadline for our office to reach back out to a civilian is 48 hours. We are, generally speaking, much faster than that in reaching out to people. Uh, we have a field team that will go out and meet with people where they are uh, so that they don't have to come to our agency. We will provide them with Metro cards to come to us. We uh, meet with people on uh, in Department of Correction custody through video conference. Uh, we we are we make the utmost efforts to try and find people. When when we before we truncate a case, it is reviewed by senior investigative staff who are really experienced and who might look at a case and say, you know, there's something that could have been done here to try and reach a civilian that this investigator didn't do, and we'll send the case back and say, try this. We don't want our standards to become a ceiling. We want our standards to be a floor to show the minimum that can be done to reach a civilian. Uh, the, and we are willing to go meet with people where they are and not just make them come down to, to 100 Church Street where we are located. We, we are, one of the things we do is we cooperate with, with many city council people, especially you, Councilman uh, Richards, we are part of our CPI initiative, Community Partners Initiative, so that we can meet with civilians in, the, in their communities where they live and work so that they can have an opportunity to easily make a statement to us. <coughs> the, so, so we share your uh, concern about truncation. We report on truncation already in our annual report, in our semi-annual report, and in our monthly reports. That being said, we understand why you want more information about this. It makes sense to us, and we submitted some changes in language to your bill, but we, we, we think in, in its spirit it's, it's a good bill, and we understand the motivation for it. The main focus on our uh, changes is to give us more let, give us the opportunity to give you more context and give you more meaningful information so you can see why things are truncating as best we can. Oftentimes it's tough for us to know why something is truncating because we weren't able to find the, the civilian in the first place. So, it, but, but there are times where uh, when we have information, we're gonna wanna give it to you. So we think the bill that we, the language we sent back to you uh, will allow us to give you the information you want in a helpful way. And yeah, and I, I hear you and I wanna thank you for that. Um, can you just go through what efforts are made um, by investigators before truncating a case? So they, they send letters, emails, and make phone calls to people. Uh, the field team will go to the scene or the investigator themselves will go to try and find the civilian so that we can get a hold of them, uh, and get a statement from them. Um, that leads me to, to this question quick, and I definitely get there probably challenges with the budget, and um, in your testimony before the Mayoral Charter Commission, you asked the CCRB budget be set at 1% of the NYPD's budget. Why is it important that the budget be linked in that way instead of allocations through the annual budget process? And I say that to say, you know, we're, we're talking about, and, and, and you've taken, how many cases did you take last year? Uh, 4,800, more than, more than 4,500 cases. More than 4,500, and you have how many investigators? 90, line investigators. 90. So if your budget were to increase, I'm assuming you would be able to hire up more and possibly even think outside of the box. Uh, I know you're doing some great work in my district office, um, but what about satellite offices across the boroughs? I mean, do, have we ever given any thought to that or perhaps having offices in each borough? Or maybe perhaps you're looking at the communities with, who've been impacted the most and 
possibly setting up an actual shop there so that you can reach people while the iron is hot. I'm assuming 48 hours, <laughs> even 48 hours, even as fast as that could typically be, you know, in, in a case, you need to be able to get to people right away. And I, my concern is that you're at 100 Church Street, and I'm not saying your people are not out doing outreach and, and doing that, but if there was an established place you know, folks could go to, I think that that would make, make a big difference in a place you can literally send teams out right away. But the only do, way to do that is through um, the budget and ensuring that you have the necessary resources to accomplish at the very least something like that that I just floated. Um, so can you speak to why you proposed that to the Charter Commission? So Mr. Chair, the, the first thing is you reminded me in your question of something that I forgot, which is the work that we've done with the underserved communities that you you're mentioned that you mentioned uh, with the LGBTQ community, with uh, with young people, with the homeless community, uh, so that we can better make sure the formerly incarcerated people, so that we can, so that they are aware that we are here to hear their complaints. When the NYPD changes its protocols or procedures, it impacts the CCRB. When the NYPD changes parts of their patrol guide, when it updates any of its technology or revises its trainings, the CCRB must update its own investigative protocols, retrain all of our investigators, and when new technologies are adopted, like how now the NYPD is using uh, drones to, uh, to get footage of people, we must revise our procedures as well. So these are, this is, this is something that has been done uh, around the country, and, and that was why we made the request. Yeah. And so other places have entertained this, and, and how much more money would this get you, do you know? Uh, I think it would get us to $55 million a year. Mm -hmm. um, let's just go through sexual misconduct quick. Uh, before we begin to wrap up, uh, so you're t obviously doing this pilot and taking um, in sexual misconduct cases. Um, go through the numbers again. How many cases did you take of sexual misconduct? Do a statement. So we've we've received 80 cases of sexual harassment this year that we uh, in 2018. Ex excuse me that we were investigating, and then uh, I think it was approximately 50 cases that we referred to DA's offices where there were uh, phase two cases, sexual assault. So out assault. of the 80, 50 were referred to? No, no, 80 phase one and 50 phase two. Okay, Which well, I guess, 130 uh, Can I just clarify that? So we received 80 allegations of sexual harassment and 50 allegations of sexual assault. So we 50 of are, sexual assault. We are we are uh, currently investigating the 80. the cases of sexual harassment, but we are in a process of uh, developing procedures where we can investigate the sexual assault cases. Right, but all fifty of the sexual assault uh, alleged sexual assaults have been referred to district attorneys for correct investigation. And then prior to this. Uh, who was overseeing this, IAB? So prior to this, we would refer all allegations of sexual misconduct to the NYPD. Okay. And do we know how many in total were referred prior to this 100? Is this 130 new, or so, were these? So these 130 were either made, they were either being investigated, they were either from open investigations during 2000, after 2000, February 2018, or were made since February of 2018. So if we had so an open So all of these case, are from 2018. Correct. And then prior to that, all of whatever else you might have received was referred to IAB. Correct. And we know where IAB ended up on any of these cases. And we were not informed by NYPD of the results of those investigations. Okay. All right, I'm gonna to begin to wrap up. I think I had, um, and I think Carlos touched on this a little bit. Um, since 2014, how many officers have been fired from the NYPD as a result of CCRB investigations and prosecutions? Uh, none so far. Zero. Uh, why doesn't CCRB seek, 
termination of abusive officers or charges and specifications more often. So the, the process that the APU uses when it is determining what level of penalty to recommend in a CCRB case is that it looks at the alleged misconduct, it looks at the disciplinary history of the officer, and it looks at the departmental precedent. So those are the three factors that we take into account when looking at uh, what penalty to recommend in a charges case. But since 2014, how many, how many times did you see termination? I'd, I'd have to check with you, uh, Councilman Richards, my, n not a lot. And you didn't find any cases worthy of, so how many cases would you say accumulated between 2014 and now? So you saw about 5,000 last year. But of on average, it's been around 4,000, I would assume, a year. So if I did the math, oh, we're in 2019 now, four times five, possibly 20,000 cases, and you didn't see fit to recommend termination of any officers. Even out of the, and I'm, I mean, out of the substantiated cases. So, so we can, as I as I told Councilwoman Chaka, we'll get you the details on how often we recommended termination for an officer. But it's it it is not a lot. The f category, the the things that we look at when we are recommending discipline, well, when we are recommending a penalty to the department, are the conduct alleged that the officer committed the the disciplinary history and rank of the member of service as well as the case law surrounding prior discipline that's been imposed on the on the other people who have been found guilty by the department of that misconduct so i will, I will end with this i, don't, I think councilmember lanson may have some questions but i just find it hard to believe that out of reviewing 20,000 cases, the CCRB could find not even five cases where you would recommend a termination? So I, I just don't have the numbers in front of, I okay. do know that no one has been terminated yet, right. but I but, don't. But how many times did you seek termination? I would we'll, we'll find out for you. Counsel. Okay, so um, I would hope that in cases where we see um, repeated misbehavior, misconduct, that the CCRB would really take that history seriously. And, and, and part of the reason I'm saying this is this adds to the legend of why individuals don't take the CCRB serious. Um, and further erodes what we're trying to accomplish, and that's real discipline. Um, I do believe for vast majority of the department, they have a lot of great officers. But we on the ground also understand that there are some officers out there who don't belong in the department at all. And for CCRB to have very little cases where they recommended termination, I find that to be a little bit troubling. And I would hope that as we move forward that we would um, ensure that it, it, you're not doing me any favors. I mean, we want to make sure the public knows who's serving them in their communities and that they are getting the best product and the best offices. And that's what creates a safer city. Um, so I, I will be quiet on that note. Um, but I would hope the CCRB uh, would certainly take that much more seriously. Uh, Councilman Lanson. Good afternoon. Um, sorry for my tardiness. I was, uh, there was a hate crime in, in Queens, which I was involved in attending to um, its aftermath. But I wanted to ask about, and if this has already been exhaustively covered, forgive me, but I wanted to ask about the circumstances 
where the um, officer is uh, found guilty by the deputy commissioner and those results were overturned by the commissioner. I think in your testimony you say that in 2017 you closed, um, the APU closed 112 cases, 59 cases in which discipline was imposed. Out of the 49 cases in which discipline was not imposed, 39 were the result of not guilty verdicts by the commissioner and four were the re result of overruling by the, by the commissioner. What, what can you tell us about the cases where the commissioner overruled the decision of the, um, uh, the deputy commissioner and whether the commissioner provides any rationale re or reasoning at least to the, to the CCRB? So, uh, Councilman, in the APU reports, we give synopsises of the cases in which the department, uh, where the police commissioner changed either a guilty plea or uh, a verdict issued by the deputy commissioner of trials or one of her assistants. So I, that data is out there. We can get it for you. I just don't have it in front of me, uh, but we'll, we'll get that for you. So what, if anything, is the commissioner, the police commissioner required, well, no, that was, that was when, I, when I saw you, Councilman, I, I thought you might ask about something else, so I had. Well, you had to tell me what you think I should be asking. <laughs> that, that sounds good. <laughs> um, does the commissioner provide any rationale for his decision to, to overturn um, the deputy commissioner's decision, which was made after a trial, seeing the witnesses? Um, in a normal legal proceeding for uh, a, a trial, court's decision, whether it's a jury or judge, to be, to be overturned, um, it's, it's necessary for there to be a rationale because that's it's not uh, unheard of, but it, it's, it's someone's saying, the commissioner's saying that, that a mistake was made. So in the, generally speaking, yes. The, the level of explanation uh, varies depending on the nature of the change. So if the police commissioner is merely changing the, the level of penalty, it can be a shorter explanation than if the police commissioner is, say, reducing the level of discipline or imposing no, no discipline at all. Uh, the police commissioner tends to write a more expansive explanation of what they've done. And is that um, required by any rule of the CCRB or in the MOU or any statute? It's in the MOU. It's in the MOU. Yes. Right. And, and then the reality is the commissioner's decision is, is final. Is there any recourse if the CCRB, having prosecuted this case, thinks that the, the commissioner um, missed some important piece of evidence or misapplied the, the law or got it wrong in some way? Is there any recourse or, or does the buck stop with the commissioner, period? So. In the process outlined by the Memorandum of Understanding, uh, before the police commissioner can, uh, can downwardly depart from an APU recommendation or a deputy commissioner of trials recommendation, the police commissioner has to do so in writing and give the CCRB an opportunity to respond. So, uh, but in the end, the police commissioner is the final arbiter, so we can you know, when, when the police commissioner informs us of his reasoning initially, we respond, uh, but that is, that is our, all, our whole recourse. But you, your opportunity to respond is before the commissioner renders a final public decision. Correct. And I don't know how public the, the final decision is because it's a disciplinary matter. Right. Yeah, the, um, the, the reasoning that you described that that is required by the MOU. Is, is that released to the public or that is just reasoning provided to the CCRB and within the office's personnel file? So this, the CCRB has been trying to improve the quality of the quarterly AP reports. And one of the things we've begun to do is include uh, descriptions of the reasons the police commissioner gives us for the actions that he takes. So at, at best, you're, the only thing the public can see is, is the CCRB's description of the commissioner's reasons. The commissioner's reasons himself, as he lays them out, that's not disclosed to the public, is it? 
I, I think we do a pretty good job, but again, you would have to talk to the department about if, if they disagree with our descriptions. No, 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 I'm sorry, I, I miss, maybe I misspoke. I, I just want to clarify. The, the commissioner has to provide a reason for why he is overturning the decision of the, 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 the trial, right? Correct. And, and that requirement it comes from the MOU. Right? Correct. Okay. The commissioner's reasoning, is that disclosed to the public or that is just shared with CCRB? My, my understanding is that it is shared with CCRB and then we make it public in our AP reports as best we can th considering 50A. All right, okay. How have you found, sorry, just last one. How have you found commissioners this commissioner, prior commissioners, um, to be in, in terms of their responsiveness and willingness to engage in a back and forth with the CCRB when they give their, their reasoning, right? I'm gonna overturn this verdict, here's why. You get an opportunity to respond. Is, is that, is that a, 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 a real dialogue, a real engagement, or do you get the sense that the commissioner's made his decision and your response is something you're entitled to, but it, at that point, no one's listening. So, so I think the uh, there have been a few cases recently that may be outliers in my mind. So, I, but where we have where we have written where we have responded, and then the commissioner has not. Uh, has has not de has not deviated, or uh, in one of those cases, he was going to retain a case and instead allowed us to proceed. So it's uh, I feel like there is a dialogue with this police commissioner, and and he he on that particular issue he he is respect. That doesn't mean that he just you know, on every case, but in these in two so, recent cases. So there are, there, are, there are cases, there are circumstances where the commissioner indicated that he was going to rule one way to overturn a decision and in, re, in, in response or in consideration of, of the CCRB's response to that, he, he changed course in some way? So there was one case where he was going to retain a case pursuant to the MOU? Uh, and not allow any uh, procedures, but he decided to allow the case to proceed. And then there was another case where uh, there was a, a plea where one of the, one of an internal PD person made a recommendation to, to lower the discipline. We responded and he kept the discipline uh, what, uh, what had been agreed to. Right. Okay, so those aren't cases where he's overturning or, or disregarding a trial verdict. They're different. Correct, but, but it, is, it is part of that process of. Got it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Um, just before you go, question on composition of the board. So do you think that the current structure of appointments allows the board to reflect the diversity of the city as mandated by the charter? <laughs> And there have been some suggestions that the CCRB charter should be modified so that the board is elected instead of appointed. Uh, do you think that such a change would help the board accomplish its goals? So Mr. Chair, I do think the, um, the, the CCRB currently reflects the diversity um, geographic and demographic diversity of the city, there is always room for improvement. Um, Give me a breakdown. So um, let me just try this off the top of my head. I don't have it at my fingertips, but I think I know everybody who's there. So there are two African-American men. There is- Not including you. Including me. Okay. There are, um, three Latino men, there are two Latino women, there's one additional woman of 
color who I think identifies as African American, but I'm not sure about that. Um, there are two white men, and I think that's who am I missing? There are three white men, I'm sorry. And how many out of all of those board members, how many have a law enforcement background? Three. three. The three um, designated by the commissioner. And any opinions on an elected CCRB? So um, I think the level of accountability that we have to public officials as uh, designated and appointed members of the board um, is key to how uh, the effective functioning of this board. Um, there is some concern, at least on my part, and I won't speak for the entire board on this, but that electing a board introduces um, a level of politics and money perhaps that will not necessarily result, I think, in what, what people may be after in their desire to have an elected board. We could, you could elect a board that was more sympathetic, for example, to the NYPD um, and as an unintended consequence with the inability to then necessarily um, hold that board as accountable as you as elected officials can hold us. Um, so I think as currently constituted. Um, we have a really effective board. I think the changes that, I think the, the desires that people have to see a more effective CCB, CCRB can happen through certain other structural changes and perhaps uh, increased capacities in areas. Um, and we'll get us closer to where folks want to be. I don't think an elected board will necessarily get us there. All righty, thank you. I'm going to go to Councilman by Danique Miller. He has a few questions, then we're going to get to the public. All righty. Sure. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, as you, as you uh, just broke down the, the, uh, the designees from CCRB by ethnic background, what, what portions of the city do they locate? Do, do, I'm sorry, do they represent? So, um, all the bar all five boroughs are represented because we have um, of the council de designees each comes from a one of the five boroughs then beyond that um, we have Brooklyn with uh, an additional member Staten Island with an additional member Queens with two additional members, that's myself and one other person, and then Manhattan with two additional members, or three. So as is currently constituted, are you satisfied that it makes up that uh, a fair representation of the entire city, the communities throughout the city? Geographically, yes, sir, I do. Mm. Um, in terms of recommendations based on the cases uh, that you've heard, what is the percentage that have been undertaken, uh, taken on by police department? And do you agree with those general outcomes? So in 75% in of our non-APU cases, which is, uh, I'm sorry, Councilman, uh, the board, when the board substantiates a case against a member of service, it can recommend five levels of discipline. The most serious level of discipline is charges and specifications, and those uh, cases go to the administrative prosecution unit or the APU. The, the other recommendations are referred to the department through the department advocate's office. So in the non-APU cases, in 75% of the time that we substantiate misconduct, uh, the department imposes discipline when we recommend discipline. In the APU 
situation, it is complicated because in 50% of the cases that go to trial, there are not guilty verdicts. Uh, are the uh, recommendations consistent the, 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 uh, are the charges or the discipline consistent with the recommendations of CCRB? And, and at, at what is the percentage on that? So you recommend something and they do something different or they, the, uh, the recommendation remains the same. What, what is the percentage in, in those cases? So the, when the department recommends a level of discipline, uh, when, when the CCRB recommends to the department a level of discipline less than charges and specifications, 75% of the time they impose some kind of discipline, but only 50% of the time is it the level of discipline that the board recommended. Do you find that do you have access to know that whether or not this is consistent with a level of progressive discipline based on CBA? So that, that's, a, that's a very sophisticated question. We are informed by the department in the vast majority of the non-APU cases through the reconsideration process of why they are why they feel a different level of discipline is is warranted, but we don't know. It, it's generally not put in terms of the CPA. So you don't have. A, first of all, discipline, uh, progressive discipline, is is is, in my opinion, uh, for corrective measures. So it, it you know it should be looked at in that. But in terms of whether or not there is a consistency in how. Discipline is delivered based on it is department charges or recommendation from CCRB or somewhere else. Um, is there does that consistency exist based on the charges? So is what we're trying to ascertain. under I understand, uh, sir. The we don't have information about the non-APU cases about whether or not the penalty that's imposed is consistent with other discipline, other s similar incidents that are not CCRB cases. We do have, we do have a, a frame of reference in the APU cases as to where the discipline and the penalties imposed uh, fall with regard to non-CCRB cases. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, I want to thank you for coming in and just want to say we appreciate the work that you do day in and day out. We know we still have some work to strengthen, work to do to strengthen you and, and obviously some laws and charter revisions and all these things that I think in 50A, which we think can all but strengthen uh, the work that you do. Uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you. We appreciate the community outreach efforts that you've certainly uh, been doing, certainly in my district and I'm sure other council members certainly could agree as well. Um, that that is such an uh, important step in building um, a communication and relationships with the CCRB and communities. And I do want to say more people know that the CCRB ex actually exists, which a few years ago it's <laughs> I couldn't say the same thing, um, especially for my district. Um, so we look forward to our continued work and relationship with you and ensuring that we can push the, the admin and the department to do better by you. So thank you for coming in today. Look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. All righty. So we're going to call our first panel, and I'm going to try not to chop up your names. Uh, Pamela Monroe, elected civilian review board. Cynthia Conti-Cook, Legal Aid Society. Elias Holtz, I think this is, Campaign for Elected Civilian Review Board, Patricia Akaman, Akiman, ECRB. Did I chop that up? Akumu. Akum, Akumu. Got it. It's your handwriting. It's as bad as mine. <laughs> And we're going to put three minutes on. We're supposed to be out of here by one. And we will try to stretch it as much as we could. 
All righty, you may begin. State your name for the record and who you're representing, Cynthia. Patricia Okomo. Once you start, there you go ahead and start, Cynthia. Cynthia Conti Cook for the Legal Aid Society. Good morning, good afternoon, maybe. Um, thank you for holding this hearing. We're looking forward to being able to weigh in on uh, the Civilian Complaint Review Board and the uh, advances it has made in the past few years. Um, I, I do want to speak to a question that um, Councilman Bo Member Richards asked in the last panel, which is uh, whether we would support repeal or reform of 50A, and I just want to emphasize that repeal is absolutely necessary of 50A. Reform is not sufficient. In a recent decision uh, passed in December from the Court of Appeals, they held that 50A is not an exemption to FOIL, but a privacy right, and without fundamentally changing that structure of uh, 50A's relationship to the FOIL laws, I don't think we're gonna get the, the reforms or action that we need. So repeal is necessary to restructure how disclosure of police misconduct records is treated um, legally on a fundamental basis. Um, to the extent any granular information is available on police misconduct information, even though it's not uh, tied to officer names, it's because of the CCRB's advances in improving its data transparency initiative. We greatly appreciate the efforts that they've made in order to make the detailed types of allegations that are uh, frequently reported available. We're looking forward to new reports. We note that there hasn't been a report from the CCRB since June 2017, which was on the right to record. And we're looking forward to more issue-based reports from the CCRB in the coming future. I realize that they um, noted that they expect um, one to come soon. Uh, I, I also just on the question of 50A want to point the council to Wilson's dissent in that case, uh, where the uh, failure to weigh the public's right to access disciplinary hearings and the related filings was emphasized. Um, and really lacked consideration, and I think it lacks consideration politically as well. We hear a lot about um, the, the potential harms to officers, but I don't think that the harms that secrecy does to community members and to the public's trust in the system and our inability to engage in an informed public discourse is really weighed properly. In addition, I would like to see the, and the CCR be empowered to make the final dis disciplinary determinations in the cases that they prosecute. The CCRB is an independent agency and it's empowered by the civilians of New York City to hold the NYPD accountable according to our sense of justice and not the NYPD's sense of justice. Uh, it is exactly because the NYPD has historically been dismissive of violations and, and um, brutality that we have embodied an independent agency with the ability to investigate and prosecute these. Um, the council should also expand the authority of the CCRB to prosecute school safety agents and other police officers who come under the jurisdiction uh, of the NYPD for purposes of training uh, and credentials. Just a few more points, I apologize. Go ahead. Um, we also really want to emphasize that the CCRB needs independence from the legal department. Multiple filings on behalf of the CCRB by the law department are in direct conflict with what the law department's interests are in these cases. They represent officers and they indemnify officers in many civil rights proceedings and for them to give legal counsel to the CCRB and the NYPD equally uh, places them in direct conflict and often results in the CCRB taking short, short shrift next to the NYPD's legal um, priorities. Um, the final thing that I would echo, I, I realize it, it may get brought up again later, is the reconsideration process is something that we believe is truly problematic. Um, the, the lack of transparency, as Councilmember Lansman uh, emphasized, that the commissioner's own determinations um, fail to keep is a problem. We don't understand what final determinations are being made and what's being considered. The only last thing that I'll mention is I realize the CCRB is interested in producing a disciplinary framework that was piloted in the last year. We uh, agree with that. We have asked for that in the past. I would just ask that if it is going to actually go forward that that disciplinary framework be made uh, publicly available. Thank you. Oh, I forgot I extended your time. I was listening, waiting for the bell. Yes, ma'am. Council member, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Patricia Okumo, a member of a steering committee. I would need more time, if you don't mind, to speak for the panel. There's three of us. 
This testimony, uh, this is a testimony on behalf of the Campaign for an Elected Civilian Review Board. We are a coalition of over 30 organizations and prominent individuals, including unions, social justice organizations, and mothers and relatives of those killed by the NYPD. We also testify today representing feedback from New Yorkers from over three years of organizing in neighborhoods suffering from police misconduct, harassment, lying, abuse, and violence. Our campaign recognizes the effort of this legislation to increase transparency in regards to truncated CCRB investigation. Civilians need to know that complaints are being taken seriously and fully investigated. It is a big problem that so many CCRB complaints aren't fully investigated. We agree that transparency is essential for accountability. However, transparency is not enough. We believe the improved data and security of the CCRB will prove that what all past reports on the CCRB have that it fails to fundamentally hold police accountable. This is not only due to the massive amount of complaints the CCRB doesn't investigate, but also because the complaints it does investigate and substitute result only in a recommendation for discipline to the N N NYPD commissioner, who is free to water down or throw out the recommendation entirely. In fact, in 2017, the department reduced the CCRB recommended penalties 73% of the time. This is the reality of our city, that the department shields its officers who commit abuses and misconduct from pu public accountability, and that the agency doesn't task with representing us, the civilians, has no real power. This is the biggest problem we see. We could use this time to read off more statistics that prove the CCRB needs fun fundamental improvement. However, the most valuable message we can give, give you is from the public, actually the people on the street that we've spoken to in all five boroughs. This truth is that people have lost faith in the CCRB. By and large, New Yorkers who need it most, those in communities of color, do not trust the system currently in place. I need more time, sorry. <laughs> because they don't see results from their complaints. I'm almost done. One revealing example from Staten Island Officer Patalio, the officer that ended Eric Gardner's life with an illegal chokehold had 14 allegations against him, four of which were substantiated by the CCRB. However, the NYPD threw out their recommendations for discipline and all Officer Patelio got was a slap on the wrist. Instruction, which the weakest of penalties and loss of two vacation days. This is a joke and an insult to those civilians he abused. If we had an effective review board that could make binding discipline, Patelio's abusive conduct could have been corrected and Eric Garnett will likely still be alive today. Eric and his family paid the ultimate police, the, uh, the ultimate price for a system that can uh, hold the police accountable, while Patilio currently makes over 100,000 a year on death duty. This is totally tr a total travesty. This unattainable reality is why we advocate for a charter amendment that will replace the current CCRB with an oversight board elected by the people and empowered by to investigate and make binding decision on discipline after thorough investigation. We call for an elected board to ensure independent oversight for the police that people in every neighborhood can trust. We also advocate for special prosecutors which will eliminate any conflict of interest that may be present. And at last, um, of course, with the district attorney's office in criminal cases involving the NYPD. We are asking that the Committee on Public Safety support in our efforts uh, in the current Charter Revision Commission. 
dozens of groups and individuals have testified for an elected and empowered review board at recent CRC hearings. We had the most te testimony of any single amendment proposed to the commission by far. This city has to stop protecting abusive police. It's time to protect the people with an elected review board. The New York can be a leader in police accountability for the whole country, and we hope we can take action together. If we fail to act, we're only waiting for another Eric Gardner, Mohammed Ba, Deborah Diner, and Saeed Vessel. Thank you for your time. We'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. So I think we've all heard this opinion before. I think the CCRB certainly shared it. Um, so in, a, with the, in the event of an elected board, you obviously would have outside influences playing a part in the process um, of electing board members. So there could be monies being poured into candidates that may actually defeat what you're trying to achieve. And so that's been an opinion we've largely heard. Uh, how would you respond to that? Well, elections are really. Is it on? Yeah. <clears throat> With the current setup, the people have no power. The commissioner makes all the decisions. An appointed board is not accountable to the people. It's accounted to the people who appointed it, the mayor, city council, the police department. And so that's not a situation where we have any recourse and so an elected board is the purest representation of the people's will that we can have. And so, yes, there will be pro-police forces running in these elections, but we've been campaigning for three years on the streets. We know the community cares about this, and they're going to run candidates that represent them. And that's, there's no substitution for an elected body when it comes to this issue where the police have an incredible amount of power and the public has none. So that's why we're pushing for an elected body. And but the police commissioner, you acknowledge, would still have the final say on discipline. So how would that differentiate? Our uh, charter amendment actually takes away the monopoly on discipline from the commissioner and gives it to the board, so they make binding decision uh, and that would, decisions. And, and how would that be achieved? I'm sorry, through charter? It's a charter revision. Charter revision, right. So you would hope that a charter revision would be made to achieve that. Mm -hmm. Okay. May, may I make a statement? Yes. Just regard to the charter revision, I just want to point out, I think it is um, Mr. Davey, uh, leadership with the CCRB stated that um, this current review board is the leader in the nation, but I just want to say right now, it looks like Rochester, <laughs> our sister city, is the leader. They just got a draft number to uh, amend their current civilian review board with uh, disciplinary uh, measures. So they're really taking the lead on this. We were hoping it would be New York City, but they have a bill number. <laughs> and just speak to, so he spoke of the diversity of the board. Uh, are you in agreement that the, the, bo the board uh, actually um, reflects the diversity of New York City? I would say it doesn't because it reflects uh, appointees by the city government, it really reflects the city government and it doesn't reflect the people. If the people get to elect a board, it will inherently reflect five boroughs of New York City. They may tick off demographic boxes and live in certain boroughs, but there's no substitution for saying that an elected board represents the people, it inherently does. And so it really reflects an appointed body and is pretty insulated from the public, you know? And what if there was some sort of proposal to expand the number of seats on the board to allow more civilians to sit on it? What would you be your thoughts around that? Actually, our proposed um, legislation does propose um, a, a board of 21 members, which would reflect uh, the city, we believe, a, a little bit more, um, more so. Um, we outline how those districts would come about uh, in the proposed legislation, which I believe you have a, a copy of. But uh, it would not just uh, reflect boroughs, but actual neighborhoods, um, specifically those communities where they have the highest number of CCRBs. There would be extra representation from those particular communities as well. Okay, thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. And we're thank gonna you. call the next panel. Nahal Zamani, Center for Constitutional Rights.
Kyleen Greer, gender, Girls for Gender Equity, and Jordan Woke. And you'll just state your names and who you're representing and then. Is this off or on? Hi, my name is Nahal Zamani and I'm representing the Center for Constitutional Rights. Great, so I wanted to um, thank first the Public Safety Committee for holding this important hearing, um, particularly given the significance of the CCRB or the board's work. Um, and the Center for Constitutional Rights um, works with communities that are under threat. We've been working with communities who are being targeted on the basis of their identity or their political work for decades. And in New York, for over 20 years, we've been challenging the NYPD's discriminatory and abusive policing practices. And in particular, um, we sued the NYPD for their unconstitutional stop and frisk program, and we're currently in the remedial phase. Since my time is pretty brief, I just want to touch on a couple of issues. Um, my testimony is a little bit more in depth. Um, but I wanted to touch on, because this came up, the significance of the CCRB's work um, nationally as a civilian oversight agency. Um, it's one of the most powerful agencies in the country currently in its functioning, but I think a number of factors that really are at the hands of the NYPD hinder the CCRB from fully meeting their mandate. Um, and one other thing that's significant about what the CCRB does is that it really opens up our understanding of how the NYPD believe, uh, thinks about and treats and disciplines misconduct by the police or by its members. And specifically, if you follow or trace the path of civilian complaints, you have a better understanding of really what's not known to most of us, um, which is a very secretive process around police accountability. Um, in particular, I think the CCRB's prosecution arm, um, which came into place under the 2002 MOU, or Memorandum of Understanding, with the NYPD is pretty key. Um, and because we have regular reporting by this unit, and I'll talk a little bit about some of their work, we have a much better understanding about the NYPD's disciplinary practices overall. But despite this, and despite uh, more commitment by the CCRB and the department to work, there are a number of actions that the police commissioner and the NYPD is taking that are ultimately hindering the CCRB from meeting its, its mandate. And I would argue for all of us for having much more accountability for police and civilian interactions. A few key developments that I think are good for uh, the committee to know about is that since I last testified before this committee nearly three years ago, uh, we now have more public reporting by the CCRB's APU unit. And the report that they came out with in this past summer I think is very illuminating. There were many disturbing trends there. And I think that um, the CCRB should be regularly sharing this information so we can get a true contemporary understanding of how the NYPD is engaging or not in discipline. I also want to commend uh, the CCRB for its increased reporting around this discipline framework. Um, and of course, we want to know a lot more, particularly if it's going to be employed by the CCRB and the NYPD. But I would just underline that it is absolutely imperative that the NYPD overall has a clear discipline framework that's adopted by all of its entities and commanders that are having a hand in discipline overall. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, committee chair. Richards and members of the Committee on Public Safety. My name is Kylan Greer. I work as the policy manager at Girls for Gender Equity, an organization challenging structural forces that work to obstruct the freedom, full expression, and rights of girls, transgender, and gender nonconforming youth of color. We are also proud members and leaders of a number of coalitions and joint campaigns that advance our work. Pertinent to today's hearing, the Dignity in Schools Campaign, the Sexuality Education Alliance of New York, and Communities United for Police Reform. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. We work daily with young women and girls of color who are policed at every juncture of their lives, on the way to school by NYPD officers, in school by NYPD school safety agents, and while accessing city services, as seen with Jasmine Headley at Department of Social Services. As such, we applaud the Civilian Complaint Review Board for its vital work to hear and act on cases where New Yorkers have been mistreated by New the New York Police Department, sometimes taking action while the NYPD takes no action, as seen with Officer Pantaleo. 
We also recognize the pivotal first step taken by the Civilian Complaint Review Board in adopting a resolution to imme immediately begin to investigate claims of NYPD sexual harassment and extortion and look forward to it being one step of many. As an agency, Girls for Gen Gen Gender Equity stands with Anna Chambers, an 18-year-old girl who was raped and sexually assaulted by two NYT NYPD officers in Brooklyn and who is one of many survivors of NYPD sexual violence. Inclu these experiences and narratives are often unheard in mainstream media or conversations about policing. This silence exists alongside a multitude of systemic barriers to reporting and survivor supports. This is absolutely and unequivocally rooted in racial and gender discrimination. We know that the survivors who are most impacted by police sexual misconduct are often the very survivors that are not believed, young people, TGNC and queer people, and or women of color. In New York City, two in five young women reported experiencing sexual harassment by NYPD officers. According to the Cato Institute, gender-based violence is the second most re reported form of police misconduct, with more than half of the reports including minors. We stand with all survivors and must emphasize the urgency of CCRB in phasing in all reports of sexual misconduct, including rape and sexual harassment. And so the option exists for all forms of sexual misconduct to be heard by the CCRB, survivors in and out of school are forced to report to the Internal Affairs Bureau of the NYPD. And just to build off, due to the recent phasing in of the, the policy of the CCRB, there is the option to, to refer cases to the DA's offices, and in the interim, the IAB still has access. This is the very same agency with officers wearing the very same uniform as the officers who are harmed, who harm the survivors seeking support. We call on New York City to take action with community input and to stand alongside women and girls of color in the fight for discriminatory and abusive policing. Additionally, Girls to Gender Equity calls for the immediate expansion of CCRB's authority to explicitly include school safety agents and other peace officers under the purview of the NYPD. Mm -hmm. Currently, pathways for reporting harmful experiences with school safety agents and other peace officers must also go to the Internal Affairs Bureau of the NYPD. Young people who have experienced reportable harm by school safety agents must have their reports handled by the very same officers who harmed them. CCRB can and should be the primary agency for these reports and should have the authority to make the final disciplinary decision in cases in which they already have oversight, including other related misconduct, which includes false statements, lying on official statements, and more. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Jordan Woke. I have no official association with any entity here. Um, I attend meetings with people in West Harlem, uh, Manhattanville area, and I've heard stories a while ago about they had problems with the police, and somebody said, why didn't you go to the CCRB? And the answer is, why bother? And that's the answer that I consistently get, so I decided to find out if I could understand why bother. So I've been going to all the borough meetings. I've been going to the meetings at 100 Church. I read the monthly and the semi-annual, the issue-based reports, I work with the Data Transparency Initiative. I attend APU trials. I certainly agree that the disposition from these trials at least should be made public. You can use PACER for the federal ones. The state has a similar system. This is hidden, and the issue has been raised before. Um, 50A, I have yet to hear someone explain how it benefits the civilians. It may be that it's true, but no one has been able to explain it to me. You spent a lot of time on non-concurrence. Um, I think that the non-concurrence rate may have gone down recently. There are multiple reasons that could have happened. One, that the police are agreeing more often or two, the CCRB is sensing what it is that the police department will accept, and therefore they can come up with the right answer. That is a particular issue. Truncation. This is a very difficult problem. I have no idea how to solve it, but when I go to these five different boroughs, predominantly the people who speak are people of color. And in fact, uh, some of them may be NYCHA housing people. 
the people who are the investigators, and I'm not saying they have to come from NYCHA housing, but have backgrounds that would make it initially very difficult for someone with a complaint to believe that the investigator understands their background. Um, growing up black in this world is really tough. Uh, New York is who no- Who you telling? I'm playing, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Um, <laughs> Well, I'm learning more about it. I'm reading more about it. Uh, and so if you've forever had difficulty with white authority coming and speaking to an investigator who has the best of intentions and really will do a very good job, I have to believe that in some cases that will dissuade one. Now, there's no solution that I can see because you can't say we will hire only those investigators who are of this sort or that sort, but in terms of the effect, so after all of my time reading and talking to people, I'm impressed with the direction that the CCRB has been taking over the last few years. I can see what they've done. I can see what they're doing. As talking to people, I know where they want to be. So I feel very comfortable that assuming the environment can improve, they're going to continue to do a better job. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you all for coming out today. Uh, we're going to close this hearing now, uh, but I want to thank everyone for coming out today. I want to thank the CCRB for the work uh, that they continue to do even through the many challenges and loopholes and um, other barriers they face uh, in pursuing justice for those of us who report to them. I um, want to thank the NYPD for their community policing and all of that good stuff but want to end by saying the police department cannot alone police the, the police department. Uh, and the only way to make sure that uh, we really hold those who, uh, those who violate the trust of the public is to ensure that there's more transparency uh, and accountability. Uh, and one way to ensure that that does happen is to ensure that there is a stronger uh, CCRB uh, as we move forward. So thank you all for coming out today. This hearing is now closed on time, one o'clock. <laughs>